Revelation chapter 3. Thank you for that good music. Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. Yeah. My, my, my. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. We'll be reading this morning, and then we'll preach on a little bit. May God help us this morning. We need Him. Verse 14, where God says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thou shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye slab, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the church. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you preach me this morning. God, I need a word from you this morning, Lord God. I need a touch from you this morning, Lord Father. I need to see you do something this morning, Lord God. Supernatural, Lord Father. Not man-made, but right from heaven. God, I pray you just come down and move. Lord, I just thank you. I just pray for what you're going to do. And I ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The letters to the churches, seven letters to seven actual churches, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. These letters are, of course, historical because they are actual places. They were actual churches. They were actual local assemblies, just like Solid Rock, just like these churches around here are meeting this morning and have a body of Christ that meet there at the local assembly. They gather together as a group of born-again believers to carry out the Great Commission. And so there's some historical stuff going on here. And the, these writings are historical. These places were actual places. But then again, it's prophetical as well. Because we know that each letter represents a certain time period uh, in the growth of the church. And we won't go into that. That's another sermon. But each church uh, age represented, represented by one of these churches. And so these seven letters there to Smyrna and Ephesus and Philadelphia and Thyatira and Pergamus and Sardis and here the Laodiceans um, are of course prophetical. But what does it mean for you and I today practically about this letter to the Laodicean church? And I believe there's some things in here we can learn uh, from these letters and there's certainly something here we can learn from this letter to the church at Laodicea. Uh, Laodicea was about 10 miles from Colossae church that Paul wrote the letter to, the letter of Colossians. It's mentioned a couple times there, Paul does in that letter to the Colossians in chapter 2 verse 1 and I believe over in chapter 4 verse 16. Uh, it was also near a famous town called Heropolis. Heropolis was famous because of the hot springs. Uh, people would go there for its medicinal purposes, for its healing purposes. And so that was one of its neighbors as well. It was a very rich uh, church, a very rich city. It was uh, one of the most important trade routes of its day. Uh, archaeologists have uncovered all kinds of advancements and, and, and just uh, modernization there that other places didn't have. Money seemed to be very prominent in this city. They were proud of their city, of course. They had a great production of, of wool. Black wool was one of their chief exports. They made a lot of money on that. They were probably most famous for their eye slab. This eye salve that they would use, uh, would, people would come from all over the world to come and have their eyes anointed with this 
solarium is what we would call it today, but uh, back then it was very famous. They would come with eye problems and this ointment would relieve some of that pain and would help heal them. And so it was very famous for these things. And now you can see why uh, when he talks about anointing your eyes, you can see that they understood what he said because that was one of the things that they prided themselves on was their eyesight. It's interesting that the name Laodicea means uh, comes from two words, uh, two Greek words, people and rule. And so uh, we get the idea here that the church was appropriately named because it would seem that instead of Jesus Christ being the head of the church, the people were the head of the church. And so there's some things here that he tells them as we go through this letter. And I believe he's speaking to us today um, in the churches around uh, this place and around this, down this road and, and what have you. And he's certainly speaking to our hearts through this. And so let's look at some practical things uh, very quickly uh, as we go through this and just pray the Lord to use this in our lives. First of all, I want you to notice that Christ reminds the Laodicean church who he is. You'll notice there when we read in verse 14, he said, I am uh, the amen, the faithful uh, and true witness, the beginning of cre the creation of God. And you'll notice that what God's telling them is you may be uh, ruled by the people, but everything begins with me. That's right. In fact, not only does everything begin with God, everything ends with him. Right. In fact, if you read the scripture, verse 1 says, in the beginning... God. You're a little slow on that. Let me try that again. In the beginning. God. And the very last verse of the book of Revelation ends with the word what? God. Amen. Some of you got it. That's okay. Close enough. <laughs> Amen. That's significant because right here in this verse, he says, I am the Amen. When you think about that, we use that word all the time. It's a Hebrew word that uh, is spelled similar to what we spell it today, but it's a Hebrew word that's pronounced Amen. And if you're from up north or in the city, you say Amen. If you're from Cameron, you say Amen. amen. And so Amen is all through the Bible. And uh, the book uh, that we read that we that's so dear to us begins with God, and it ends with that capital Amen. Yeah. It ends with Jesus. It begins with Jesus and it is with Jesus because uh, all things were created by Him and for Him. It was not anything made that was made without Him. Okay? And so everything has to do with Jesus Christ. This book has to do all about Him and His plan of redemption for man. It's all about Him. Jesus is God's Amen. Now the word Amen uh, oftentimes is a phrase that means let it be so. Or so be it. And we say it all the time. And some of the times we say it and we don't really understand or understand what it means. But it means, let it be so. It means, amen means that it's a sure thing. Amen means that it's something trustworthy. Amen means something that's firm, that's settled. In other words, God's Word is the final word on anything and settles all things. And the Bible says that He is God's amen. Now this word is used 126 times in the New Testament. It's oftentimes translated verily, verily. And so when Jesus was saying verily, verily, he was saying truly, truly. In other words, when in the Hebrew, he was saying amen, amen. In other words, every time you see that, it's the Hebrew word amen. It's used 126 times in the New Testament. Second Corinthians uh, verse uh, 20 in chapter 1 tells us that for all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. In other words, what he's saying there is Christ is the guarantee of everything in Him. Without Christ, this doesn't mean anything. Without Christ, these promises aren't true. You can't rely on them. We might as well pack up and go. Listen, every, listen. he's the bank account that every check from heaven is written on. He don't bounce his checks. He don't lie. He backs up what he can say. Listen, you can brag on this person. You can brag on that person. But at the end of the day, they'll all let you down. And they'll all tank out. They'll all be something that, listen, they're up one day, down the next. You can count on them here, but you can't count on them there. But He is God's Amen. He'll never fail you. He'll never forsake you. It's used 26 times in the Old Testament. That word I'll be. Isaiah 65, 16 says, That he who blesses himself in the earth shall be blessed himself in the God of truth. The word truth there is that word amen. It means he's the God of the amen. Isn't that good? Everything that he says is amen and amen. 
It says, And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of the Amen. Because the former troubles are forgotten, because they are hid from my eyes. Seven times he uses this word Amen in the book of Revelation. He says, To him be glory and honor and dominion forever. Amen. Put an amen right there. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, Revelation 1 7 says that behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. amen. That's an amen. I'll amen that. Amen to that. I am he that liveth and was dead. Whoa! And behold, I live evermore. Amen to that. Amen. He goes on to say, listen, he says, write these things through the church. He does say it. I'm the true and faithful witness. I'm the God of the Amen. Chapter 5 says, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. And chapter 7, 12 says, Amen and Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And then, listen, chapter 19 says, And they fell down at His feet and they worshipped Him. Amen. Jesus used it when He walked on the earth. Matthew chapter 6, He said, Listen, you, you know this one. It says, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. amen. I'll amen that. Teaching us to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. amen. Y'all ain't getting this. He's got amen what I'm talking about this morning. Everything he says is amen. It's firm. It's stout. It's sure. It's true. And it'll come to pass just like he said it was. He's the amen. Amen, amen. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that not sent me had, and has sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Verily, verily, amen, amen. I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. Amen. You're getting it now. He says, unto you, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall unto the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. I can work, listen, he can work all things. Now listen, out in my life and in your life, he can get it done because he's a God of heaven. He's created all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Somebody say amen. He's the amen. He'll always be the amen. Listen, he's wonderful. He's a counselor. He's, he's a savior. And everybody said amen. amen. Because he's the amen of everything in this precious and holy book. Yeah. The Bible says that therefore there's coming a day when every knee yeah. woo, in heaven and in earth and under the earth is going to bow and every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. amen. You better believe it, honey. He's the amen to this Bible. And everything he said is true. He cannot lie. And he said, listen, church, you think you're running things down there in Laodicea, but I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm the creator. I'm the very God of gods. I am God's amen. And everything in this book is backed up because of my life, because of my death, and because of the resurrection amen. Amen. tomb. He said, I'm the amen. Amen. Put an amen right there. Amen to that. But I'm ready to, I'm ready to preach now. That's just what it does. <laughs> Two, not only does it remind them of who he is, he reveals to them what he knows. He knows. Amen. Not what you know. Amen. You just think you know. Amen. I just think I know. I got everything figured out. I think I know this. I think I know that. But I don't really know a whole lot. I want to tell you right here. This right here knows. This is black. Listen, I like that. Black and white. Right or wrong. Don't you hate to live in a world that's gray? That's what you live in a world today. Everything's gray. Well, it's right for some people. It's not right for them. It's true for some people. It's not true for some people. No wonder everybody's confused. They think they know. But he knows. Now the phrase here that he uses in verse 15 is, I know thy works. It's the one phrase in every, every one of the seven letters. Think about that. That's all. But think about what that in every letter he says, I know thy works. He said, you know what? He looks now, he says, I know what's going on at old solid rock. 
Amen. You might think something's going on in Solid Rock, but I know what's going on in Solid Rock. Amen. It's I know. You may fool yourself. You may go home and fool yourself. I can fool this is myself, but at the end of the day, he says I'm looking down on the churches and I'm looking down on the Laodicean in church, and I know your works. Right. Amen. <clears throat> I will tell you, our works don't save us. Right. Right. Yes, sir. You didn't do anything to get saved. Now, the Bible's clear on that. He's not talking about works for salvation. Ephesians 2 clears that up. Verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's not of yourself. Listen, it's not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. For he, we are his work. Listen to me. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. You see, salvation is not of works. Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. Not you, Jesus is. Now I can't explain that, and if I could, you couldn't understand. He's God. I'm just telling you. He's the author and finisher of your faith. He's the faith initiator. And He's the faith finisher. You're not the covenant maker. He's the covenant maker. You're not the covenant keeper, friend. He's the covenant keeper. That's right. It's not on you to keep the covenant. He's keeping it. You can't keep it. You didn't find Him. He found you. You didn't, you didn't love Him. He loved you. You came with your tattered garments and your filthy rags and He put a, a robe of white on you. Amen. You're not righteous. He's righteous. Amen. You're guilty. He's innocent. Amen. You've got no part in keeping that salvation. You've got no part of granting salvation. Your works are not getting it done. If you're in here this morning and you're trying to get to heaven by who you are, friend, you're going to fall short. The best day you ever live will not get you into heaven. Well, I've had some pretty good days. I preach the Word. Hey, a few days see some people get saved. It's just one thing after another. Man, I just thought the day was great. Hey, it's just the best day I've ever lived, Lord. I've never had a day of ministry like this. And it was nothing but filthy rags in His sight. You better believe it. Works has no part in saving us. But <laughs> the idea that you can get saved and it doesn't change your life, that's not taught in this Bible right here. That's not taught. Listen, if your Bible's teaching that, and then there's a trash can on the way out, put it in it because it don't teach that. That's right. Listen, the idea that you get saved and there's never any fruit is foreign in this Bible. Amen. You won't find that. You won't find that. You can't have the Creator, the Amen of God, come reside in your heart and think you're going to be the same. It can never happen. It couldn't happen. It'd be impossible for it to happen. Here's what he's talking about. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. What does it profit my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? Now he's not talking about salvation faith. He's not talking about saving faith. He's talking about what I'm fixing to read to you. If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? That's like the guy come up to you and say, Listen, I'm starving. Man, I've been laid off at work. Well, my family's in bad shape. And you say, well, well, I hope that works out for you. I'll pray for you. What? <coughs> Your refrigerator's full? Your wallet's full? Yeah. You say, well, I'll pray for that, brother. Mm. That's what James told me. There's a lot of talking going on in James today about what was real and what wouldn't. Oh, and there's a lot of talking about today about uh, what is and what's not. But James said, listen, if you put some feet to your faith, or you better question something. 
Notice what he goes on to say. Even so, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Amen. 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 The Lord reveals to them what He knows. They said, we're rich. Got need of nothing. He said, no, you're miserable. You're poor. You're rich. Oh, the Lord also reproves them. <coughs> so then because in verse 16, thou uh, are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now I don't want to talk to you this morning about vomit and throw up, but that's what that word means. I'm not trying to be coarse up here, but that's, that's what it means. Out of all the Scripture in the Bible, Think about that. The one thing that God says made him sick, made him want him to bond, was a lukewarm church. Yeah. You see, uh, you know what? God looks at things so different from how we look at things. You know what lukewarm is? Lukewarm is if you're on a scale from 1 to 10 in your Christian walk, and you're a five. That makes God sick. Five? Listen, you mean to tell me, Lord, you'd rather have a church full of ones than full of fives? Hey, I'd take a church full of fives any day. I mean, you'd rather have someone that's just, everybody uh, is cold and, and they don't read their Bible and they, they ain't doing, listen, oh, I don't want no ones. What was I want a five? When I was in school, make a C. Man, I tear. Man, I was glad to get a C. <laughs> I'd come home and brag that thing to my parents for two days. Say, what are you talking about? You mean you'd rather have a one, an F, instead of a C? That's so unlike that, isn't it? You see, a five, listen, a five, think about that. If you're sitting here today, and let me just ask some questions. I've looked in the mirror this week and had to ask some questions in my life. What am I from one to ten in my walk with the Lord? That's good. How many of us would say, I'm a five, and I'm glad of it? I'm satisfied. I'm just in the middle of the road. You know what five's doing? He's not doing anything wrong. He's not doing anything. A five, listen, he's not a bad witness. He's just not a witness at all. They're just fives. I mean, if I was to stand before God this morning, would he say, you know what? I'd say you're a five, preacher. I'd say you're just a five. God said, five makes me sick. Can I say something to you this morning? That hurt me this week. The times I've been a five. Man, I've hung around five plenty of times. Satisfied. Just being a five. Satisfied just being comfortable. Satisfied just reading my Bible sometimes. Satisfied just praying sometimes. Satisfied. I, I come. Listen. I, I come. I come to church sometimes. I, I come to church a couple times a week. I'm here sometimes on Sunday. I'm a five. Can I say something to you this morning? You know, no matter whether I bring a cup of boiling water or I go back to the kitchen and bring a cup of frozen water. If I bring it into the church this morning, you give it a little time, and it'll be the same temperature as that church. Well, I think I'm preaching there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. And no matter how hot it is, you might be boiling hot. And you come into the church house, and I got the temperature set just what it is in here. And you just give it time. It might take it a while to come off a bowl, but eventually it'll be the same temperature this church is. Mm. Same thing in my home. Same thing in my own life. Am 
my, my, my. <clears throat> Verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy me gold, tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich in white raiment, thou mayest be clothed in the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye slay, that thou mayest see. You know what he said you need to do? He says, you need to get in the fire. <laughs> You know why I told him to get in the fire? Because, listen, gold don't... You know gold won't burn? Y'all act like I just told y'all a lie. I didn't hear one amen off that. Gold won't burn. You know what gold does in the fire? It just gets better. It just gets more pure, don't you? No battles, no bless, No adversity, no advancement. Then he says... Get something to open your eyes with. Put something on there. And get something with your eyes so you can see. You know what, church? Do you know a church? Listen. Proverbs says where there is no vision, the people perish. You can't get a vision if your eyes not right. You can't get a vision if you focused on anything but Him. The Bible says looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. What's your vision this morning? You know, if I don't get a vision as a pastor of this church, this church is not going to have a vision. Right, that's right. In other words, it's not what I need and what I need to tell you. It's, am I doing what it takes in my quiet time, in my study time, and am I living accordingly where God can give me a vision that I can give to you? And then the Holy Spirit take that vision I give to you and make it real to your life, make it real to my life, and we get around that vision and we go forward for God. That's how that thing works. That's it. Yep. You can't form a committee to get a vision. Amen. Come on. Amen. Right. Somebody ought to amen. Right. Right. You can't do it. A vision is from God Himself. Amen. It's not so much of what we have, but who we have. Yeah. You have a vision this morning? I have a vision this morning. He said, you're blind. You ain't got any vision. And you're perishing. And the last one, let me close with this. I've done one over. I won't go over tonight. I try not to. By the way, we have, we have service right here tonight. We didn't take a bunch of them out there. Okay, if you want to go to that, you can. If you want to come here, you can. And I'll spit and holler again tonight. He's the same guy. Amen. It is this morning. The Lord remembers His great mercy. The last part of this. I like verse 19 says, As many as I love. Mm. You think about that. He said, I'm going to tell you how you're living. He said, You're not cold, and you're not hot. That's, that just hurts. He said, And you make me sick. I'm watching how you live. You got a Bible under your arm. You don't hardly read it. You come to church, you never worship. You with me on that? And I'm preaching to myself. He said, you make me sick when I see what you're doing. You make me bomb. You make me throw up when I think about what you're doing in my church. But he said, I love you. Hey, you think about that? Yep. Yep. Yeah. He said, as sorry as you are, as pitiful as you're doing, you've got the Holy Spirit of God, you've got the name of Christ on your church, and you're nothing but a bunch of fives. You're not getting anything done Oh, how I love you. Oh, how I love you. Oh, how I love you. Because I love you, I'm going to chasten you. You know, God don't chasten you. You're not a son. You're none of his people chasing you. Amen. And you might not like that. Listen, I, don't you just hate getting a whip? Yeah. Mom and Dad, I just want I hate it when y'all used to whip me. <laughs> You can, you can read Dr. Spock and you can do whatever you want to. That's your business. I'm going to tell you, spare the rod, spoil the child. Amen. 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 You don't discipline them because you don't love them. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, it, take, it takes your patience to discipline. No. Amen. Well, it takes some getting up, pulling little Johnny and Susie out of the church, and tearing that tail out. 
Why don't you have to get up with your kids? Well, I don't anymore, but if Cooper or Bailey, because they're grown. They get, they know, hey, it's on. I, even today, I'd I have, mm. But I remember taking them out. We were sitting out there in the pew, you know, I had to pick them up and take them. I ain't nothing embarrassed. Jamie done that all the time. I didn't, but Jamie did. <laughs> I said, I love it. I'm going I'm to I'm beat you. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to beat you. I don't know what I mean. He said, I love you. Repent. But then he says this. He said, I'm standing at the door. He says, I'm not. Amen. And that's, that's present tense. That's written in the present tense. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't stop knocking. How sad churches everywhere around this nation today are having a church without Jesus. Yeah. They come in empty and they leave the same way. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is standing outside the door knocking. There's a famous picture you've probably seen it in St. Paul's Cathedral there in London. Put a painter there, he painted that same picture. In this verse and the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. And he's outside of that door and he's knocking. And we use that all the time for evangelistic service. I've preached on that. Knocking on people's lost people's heart. He does that. This is to the church, friend. This ain't written to lost people. This is written to the church. This is written to an actual place. And he's saying, I'm still knocking. I'm still waiting to come in. That picture, uh, listen, that picture was missing something the, when he first painted it. A man came to the artist. And he said, the picture's great. He said, but you forgot to put the doorknob on the door. And he said, no, I didn't forget. The doorknob's on the inside. Right. Yeah. People come to church without Jesus. We wonder why it's so dead. And how merciful He is. Amen. He's knocking on churches all over the place. He's knocking on homes. Let me go there for a minute. Yeah. He's, knocking on, he's, re, he's knocking on your home. And my home. He's ready to come in. And then notice last of what it says, and I'll close with this. He said, I'll come in and I'll sup. Yeah. S-U-P. Jesus used that word. You know what? It's our word. We get our word from it. What? Supper. You know what supper is? Supper's the last meal right before it gets gone. Yes, you didn't, you, you didn't get me, did you? More time running out. Are you a five? I mean, were you a five when you came in here and you thought, man, I'm satisfied with being a spy? Jesus said, I just seem to be a one. And be a five. <coughs> I want to put the stand. As we close, what are we saying, brother? What number is it? Somebody come up here and leave this thing. <coughs> Friends, we need to stop being fives and let the fire come down on our lives, on our churches. Listen, I don't know how long it's been since you've worshipped. Uh, you may be a while you've been to church. What number is it? 336. 336. We're going to sing a few verses. We're going to have a little time here at this altar. And then we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Maybe you just need to do say, you know what, Lord, I need to come. I need to get right before I take this Lord's Supper. I need to come down here and do business with you. And I need to get my heart right. And I need to get things settled with you. Maybe I've just been a five for a while. And, and, and listen, a five. And, and I need to do something about it. I need God to light a fire in my life. I, just, I need to be more than a fire. I'm sick of being a fire because God's sick of me being a fire. Fire's not going to get it in the times we live in. You know why? Because that's the end time church, the Laodicean church. But listen, we need to come in and be more than a fire. You take a good look at your heart this morning and say, Lord, what am I? And when He reveals it to you, you come down here and do business with Him. It's been a while since you came into the house of God and worshiped. I really felt the presence of God. Maybe you just straddling the fence. Maybe you're a five.
Maybe you need to get back and do business with God this morning. So you can feel His presence. Maybe this morning you say, I'm not sure I'm saved this morning. I don't know if I even rate it off. Pastor, I don't know. I'm not sure about my eternal destination. I'm not sure the Holy Spirit's in me. I'm not sure if I've been born again. I'd love to tell you about Jesus this morning. You're coming up. Share a few verses with you. You sure that thing up? Can't do any. Can't go forward for God until you sure that thing up in your life. Make Jesus Christ a Savior. Know that you know He's a Savior. We'll give you another, another verse or two. You come. You need to do business with God. Come on down. You just come. serious because it's a serious thing to take the Lord's Supper. And so uh, what an honor it is uh, to be able to share in that and to be a witness to that. The Bible says uh, as Paul was talking this to the Corinthians church and, and go ahead if you guys want to prepare the table as I kind of explain this. He said for I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus that same night in which he was betrayed took the bread. And the bread represented his body. It would be broken for you. And he also took uh, the, the fruit of the vine that night, which is the blood that represents what he shed for you. And, and you think about what he's done for you, and how he loves you, and you know how serious it is to partake of these ordinances, and they're very special, and it's an honor to be able to do that. And, and so, I'm going to ask if Brother Donnie would Give thanks for the bread that was broken for us. Brother Don. Our Father, we truly thank you, Lord, for the bread that was broken for us, Lord. We thank you about your life, Lord. Yes. You gave your life for us on that old rugged cross, Lord. I pray that you just bless us, Lord, together here this morning, Lord. So we thank about that. They have been done so graciously for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
said, this, this cup, this is blood that I'm going to shed for you. This drink in the of the man, all together. Lord, thank you for the precious, precious blood. Lord, you shed on Calvary, Lord Father. Lord Father, what you did there, Lord God, that you might be saved and that you resurrected and live forevermore, Lord. On the throne of heaven, Lord God. So thank you. And we praise you. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for observing this precious time together in communion. Because we can do this, we have, it symbolizes that communion we have with Him. And the communion at His table never runs in. It never runs dry. As a church, we come together. And we've got the blood between us. If we're born again. If you're saved this morning, we've got the blood between us. Aren't you glad of that? You know, please stand if you would. I encourage you to come back tonight. We'll run a little long today. We'll get you out of here tonight so you can get to bed at least by midnight. <laughs> so we appreciate it. We just appreciate you so much. And again, we'll give us that card there. And your way out, if you're a visitor with us, we want to get to know you. We love you appreciate you. We, we, we value you being here. I know we do. So I'm going to ask Brother Sean to just close some word of prayer. Lord, well, just thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here, Lord, and just uh, worship in your name, Lord. Just thank you for dying on the cross, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings you give us, Lord. And I just ask you to be with us the rest of the day, Lord. Bring us to gather the next point in time, Lord. And just, uh, just thank you again for just loving us so much, Lord. In the Son's name we pray. Amen.